Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to have Sarah Juliet Lauro here with us. Um, Sarah is an assistant professor in hemispheric literatures in the Department of English and Writing at the University of Tampa. Um, Sarah is here to talk about her new project, which in some ways stems from her earlier work. Um, she's perhaps best known for her article, A Zombie Manifesto, um, and also for her book, uh, The Transatlantic Zombie, Slavery, Rebellion, and Living Death. And um, so Sarah's earlier work on the zombie was talking all about how the zombie is about slave rebellion. And she's now carrying that into the world of video games and gaming, talking about slavery in that context. So I'm really thrilled that she's here uh, with us. And I hope that many of you got a chance to demo Thralled in our cafe lobby outside. If you haven't yet, it will be playing after the talk. And we encourage you to check it out. Um, it is a game still in development. And you'll hear Sarah talk a little bit about it. Did I introduce myself? I'm Ashley. <laughs> I am uh, the curator of theater and dance here at the Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center, <laughs> MPAC at Rensselaer, and I also curate our talks series. Um, so without further ado, I'm not going to waste any more of our time, and I'm going to bring Sarah up um, to share her great talk with you all. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. Well, as you guys probably know, if you've been to an academic talk before, they always start with a period of thanking people, and then the academic reads the, the, the paper. Um, I'm going to try to do it as actively as I can, but it is a long talk, so there will be some reading. Um, but first, I also just want to take a moment from the heart to say how incredibly grateful I am for this opportunity, and it really just deserves to be underscored a little bit here. I had such enormous success publishing on the zombie that nobody ever wanted to hear me talk about anything else ever again. <laughs> and I was really starting to feel like a one-trick pony and that I was not going to get out of this rut. And then this invitation came along swiftly thereafter. A part of the talk that you're going to hear me give tonight was accepted for publication. So I feel like I have finally broken free of the zombie curse, and I'm happy to be moving on to other things. I just want to extend such a heartfelt thank you to the director of your center, Johannes Goebel, of course to Ashley Farrell Murray, who I feel like is my new BFF, um, and to all of the wonderful people that made this visit possible, Ian Hamlin, Janelle Falk, and because so many of us today, as I've gotten to know you and talked to your students, we even did some walking through the snow and into the town, so I hope you'll forgive me for just referring to you by your first name, but I do want to also thank Avery, Steve, Nick, Jeff, Dave, Eric, George, Josh, Carl, Vic, Mick, Robert, Rebecca, and Ben. So thank you guys so much for having me here. I've had an amazing, amazing day. All right, so what I'm going to talk about tonight, I'm going to talk about a few different kinds of digital games today. Educational computer games, the art game Thralled, that hopefully many of you had a chance to demo this afternoon and a bit about some mainstream entertainment games from the Assassin's Creed series, which allow the player to be transported to a distant past and experience a fanciful history. So let's get started appropriately with a little bit of time travel. I want to take you back to a year ago, the opening of the new year, 2016, when the future, some of us might say, still looked bright. <laughs> There are four parts to this talk, and there are a lot of visuals, though it is a bit long, so I hope that you won't be too bored. I was reading my Twitter feed like an oceanic map, surveying the first weeks and months of the new year, 2016, noting various plateaus of social media controversy surrounding representation of blackness and the black struggle, or its neglect in popular culture. From hashtags like Oscar So White, which highlighted a monochromatic slate of Academy Award nominees, to controversy surrounding the casting of light-skinned Zoe Saldana to play legendary singer and dark-skinned Nina Simone, to the news that white British actor Joseph Fiennes had been tapped to play the king of pop Michael Jackson, and 
From Quentin Tarantino's 70 millimeter repartee to critics of his 2014 film Django Unchained, to the debut of Nate Parker's film Birth of a Nation about rebel slave Nat Turner, which premiered at Sundance to great acclaim, but would later fall prey to a controversy surrounding the director's past. The issue of how blackness is represented in our culture and who gets to make that representation loomed in the new year like an emerging landmass. And all of this was before Beyonce's music video formation dropped, coming into view like the unconquerable Arctic. Fans and scholars alike were captivated by the celebration of black culture and the references to Black Lives Matter in formation and in the visual album Lemonade, which debuted on HBO some months later. Formation, for example, references various sources of black empowerment in its celebration of the singer's own heritage. For example, in the line, my daddy Alabama, mama Louisiana, you mix that Negro with that Creole, make a Texas Bama. From visual references to the plantation and imagery evocative of Hurricane Katrina, to the most controversial part of the video, of a young boy dancing before a line of cops in riot gear, the video is a portrait of a culture that has endured despite and continues to struggle against the gross injustices of white society. There's actually a fair bit I could say about the way Beyonce's music video works in, com in comparison to some of the video games I'll discuss here, especially Liberation, in which the player incarnates a free woman of color in New Orleans. Formation casts Beyonce in a range of roles as she changes outfits and hairstyles. Like the imagined player of Liberation, seen there at the bottom, I mean character of Liberation, Beyonce appears to travel through time in the music video, perhaps inhabiting her own ancestry, either personal or cultural. In several scenes, she dons the dress of the antebellum period, referencing quadroon society, I think it could be argued, in her corset and parasol. But later, too, the New Orleans brothel is referenced when the singer sports Storyville stockings. She invokes voodoo when, dressed all in black with a flat-brimmed hat hiding her eyes, her appearance is suggestive, if only barely, of Baron Samedi. And her movements raise the specter of voodoo queen Marie Laveau. From beauty and sexuality to black magic, Beyonce's video alludes to many of the tropes associated with black feminine power. The same that we see exhibited as weapons wielded by Aveline in the Assassin's Creed game, Liberation. I'll leave the analysis of Beyonce's formation to those more qualified to speak on the music video's representations of race and sexuality. But my interest here is in Bay as barometer in contextualizing the cultural moment that appeared to be dawning as the calendar changed. Around the same time, the cable channel WGN began airing its series, Underground, about a group of slaves that conspire to flee as enslavement. And promotion began for the reimagination of the 1970s miniseries, Roots, based on the novel by Alex Haley, which would premiere on Memorial Day of 2016. In April, it was announced that Harriet Tubman would replace Andrew Jackson on the front of the $20 bill. In short, we seemed to have entered a moment in which, finally, we could overtly celebrate legacies of slave revolt in our nation. My sense is that this emerged as a result of the Black Lives Matter movement, and that flashpoints like Beyonce's Lemonade, with its extended views of the plantation, indicated that we were at last willing to face the way that the institution of slavery continues to plague our culture and celebrate those who struggled against its many cruelties. But alas, 2016 would end with an ugly presidential election that some might say worsened the racial divide in our nation. The reality we now face as a culture only makes the work of understanding slave revolt and its legacy in contemporary political resistance all the more urgent. Like many of you, I'm sure I could spend my whole time today discussing Beyonce's music video. But the part that is relevant to my presentation actually comes not from Formation or Lemonade, but from a Saturday Night Live sketch that, lamp <laughs> that lampooned the overreaction of the white community to formation. 
which included calls for police to boycott Beyonce's concerts and even an overwhelmingly unsuccessful protest in Manhattan. In the SNL sketch called The Day Beyonce Turned Black, white people lose their minds over the video and song, and society devolves into chaos. In one shot, some office workers at their cubicles explain their confusion. A man begins by quoting Beyonce's lyrics. I've got hot sauce in my bag swag. What does that even mean? A colleague muses in a state of shock, maybe it's not for us. Close to hysterics, another office mate shouts, but usually everything is. <laughs> I want to use this moment from the SNL sketch as a keyhole with which to frame the central tension of the films and video games about slave revolt that I'm currently investigating for what I hope will become a book project called Kill the Overseer, Commemorations of Slave Revolt in Literature, Film, Art, and Digital Culture. In short, the central question I am struggling to answer is who are these texts for? Right now, the part of this project that I'm working on is the section devoted to video and computer games depicting slave resistance. So that's what I'm mainly going to focus on tonight. My objective is to probe the issue of how such texts communicate their intended audience, even at times holding off certain viewers or gamers who would gain admittance, and where the ludic aspects of the gameplay reinforce themes of slavery and revolt. Tonight, I'm going to present online, computer, and video games for the way their formal poetics address the politics of spectatorship or tourism implicit in interactive narratives about historical slavery, even as they themselves afford an active role to the participant, which is not without complications. Or, more simply stated, like Beyonce's use of mysterious words indecipherable to the white office workers, these video games designate sometimes even within the structure of the game as game, who the text is for and who it is not for. Often, as I'll talk about this evening, this tension is framed by the use of language, including in some instances, shibboleths that divide the gamership. But before I present that part of my argument, they would seem useful to just make sure that the audience is acquainted with the field of video games about slavery and slave revolt. So we traveled back in time to early 2016, and now I want to take you on a different kind of a journey, a brief tour of games about slavery. It might seem strange that I want to begin by addressing a game that is not digital at all, but made out of wood. A simple and a terrible game about the transatlantic slave trade made by veteran video game designer Brenda Romero. The few photos that are available of the game online show simple, unpainted wooden pegs of various sizes, little anamorphic people like a lowercase i crowded into a box in a manner suggested of the famous illustration of the Brooks slave ship diagram seen there at the bottom. In her TED talk called Gaming for Understanding, Romero describes the experience of creating this game about the Middle Passage for her seven-year-old mixed-race daughter. After having her daughter paint wooden pegs into families designating different colors for different kin groups, they play a game which forces the player to make choices about who goes in the boat and who stays, and what to do if food supplies run, run low, which is determined by rolling the dice. In Romero's description of their early play, she recounts that her child was attempting to keep families together and people alive, but the dice were not rolling in her favor. Romero recalls putting a hard choice to her daughter, quote, we can put some people in the water or we can hope they don't get sick and we make it to the other side, end quote. This game, which Romero would title The New World, is, like her other games in the series, not a purchasable commodity, but rather a kind of installation exhibit. Romero's games work in an altogether different manner than most, then. While it fits the criteria of a game defined by Roger Calois, for example, in which, quote, the player feels emotionally attached to the outcome, end quote, it doesn't, it doesn't foster a positive feeling. What this game does differently than most of the educational games about slavery that I'll address herein is that it forces the player 
into the position of slave runners rather than runaway slaves. Leaving aside the issue of whether or not this still amounts to enjoyment, broadly speaking, of historical tragedy, this educational game at least encourages personal growth, empathy, and political action. The same cannot be said of a computer game called Playing History, Slave Trade, upon which I will not dwell, though it needs to be addressed. Playing History, Slave Trade got into hot water for a scene in which the player had to stack bodies in a slave ship in a manner similar to the game Tetris. The backlash in which journalists took to calling the game Slave Tetris forced the game manufacturer to remove the scene in question and replace it with something just barely less offensive. The rest of the game is still highly offensive. The player controls the character of Putij, rechristened Tim by his master, a black cabin boy on a slaver ship, taking all manner of abuse from the captain, including racist epithets like being called a jungle jingle. The central play of the game concerns Tim's quest to free his sister and other slaves, even as he appears to be acting as translator and facilitating a negotiation with African chieftains, as seen in the top image there, for the sale of more slaves. Tim has some interesting choices to make, such as how he will respond when the chief says, I'm surprised to see one of our own representing the white devils. As is the usual convention in this type of game aimed at young children, the player clicks from a set of dialogue options. Quote, I'm here against my will. Or, quote, I'm here to bring hope to the slaves. Or, quote, I'm here to bring you a gift. This last option earns you three trust points. Aside from the discomfort of being placed in this position of a slave responsible for the enslavement of others, the game has other problems. The style of the animation reduces real human pain to a caricature. The figures are cartoonish with tiny bodies and large heads and their huge round eyes. The aesthetics, hopefully unwittingly, recall the trope of the children's toy gollywog or the little black sambo of Helen Bannerman's 1899 children's book. Further, the game offers little actual education about the period, aside from a few sidebars about commodities like brandy and tobacco, and muddles the value of any historical content by the presence in the game of a giant cartoon mouse wearing a bicorn hat who provides commentary in an overly chipper tone and gives the protagonist magical time-bending goggles. I couldn't get a good picture of the mouse. If the goal is to make it clear to children that these horrors were lived realities for real people, then this game fails utterly in that capacity. I could go on about the game's shortcomings, but this is obviously low-hanging fruit, so I'll leave it there. Better are educational games like Mission US, Flight to Freedom, in which the student plays the character of Lucy King, a 14-year-old on the King Plantation in Kentucky, who must make decisions about whether to follow orders or resist and can even earn badges for building alliances, knowing when to play it safe, and for resistance and sabotage, for things like directly disobeying the master's orders. In five parts, plus a prologue and an epilogue, the game guides the player through a series of tasks. In part one, you navigate the day-to-day -day of life on a plantation, including acts of subterfuge and protection of your fellow slaves. In act two, Accused of purposefully setting the smokehouse on fire, you escape in the company of another slave, Henry, who is a habitual runaway due to be sold at auction. I have to admit that it took me a day to get past the simple second level of this game. The character flees the plantation through the use of connections on other plantations and supportive channels similar to the Underground Railroad, forging road passes and stealing food from gardens, trying to make her way to freedom. But I got caught by the slave catchers or died of starvation and exposure every time I tried to escape until I was at last willing to abandon my traveling companion and accept a wagon ride north alone. In part three, the player performs a series of tasks in Ohio where you are disguised as a relative of a free family of color, trying not to raise the suspicion of the many slave catchers in the area. 
In part four, you strengthen your connection to abolitionists and other freedom fighters and help to facilitate the escape of your brother Jonah, whom you left behind on the King Plantation. In part five, the man posing as your uncle is illegally kidnapped by slave traders, a la Solomon Northrop, and you and your brother help to gather evidence to free him in a court of law. At the end of part five, however, you are caught by a slave catcher and sold at auction. In the epilogue to the game, the player can use all of the badges accumulated during the regular gameplay to construct a conclusion for Lucy's story. And the player is encouraged to play through this level several times. In one option, you are sold south and live out the rest of your days hoping to meet up with your mother. In another, you are sold out west and find solace by starting a family. If you have earned enough badges, you could escape to Canada and rejoin old friends. Or you play your literacy badge to act as a white abolitionist assistant and eventually meet Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Or you fall in league with Harriet Tubman and return to Maryland to be a conductor on the Underground Railroad. Though this game has also been criticized for its packaging of slavery as fodder for educational entertainment, I would emphasize that there's not really much that is fun about the game. The first level, in fact, in which Lucy merely does her chores on the plantation is positively exhausting, with the player having to continually click through a series of tasks if she doesn't want to raise the ire and suspicions of the overseer. My sense is that the game probably does provide a useful experience for the contemporary elementary school child who does digital labor as Lucy, makes choices as her, and regardless of one's best efforts, fails to keep her safe from recapture. There's a lot more I could say about the productive way the game works, but I think here I'll just emphasize one thing that is immediately visible in a series of panels from when Lucy is waiting to be called to the auction block. Whereas for most of the game, Lucy is given choices to advance the narrative in which the player clicks an option to designate the selection. In this sequence, the same image is shown with different descriptions appearing superimposed over the image. To each one, the player has but one option, to click the, the box marked OK. This part of the narrative, therefore, sounds like this. You are put into the pen where the slaves wait to be sold. OK. There are guards everywhere. OK. Across from you, a woman sobs softly. OK. Outside, the auctioneer does his job. OK. You never dreamed that you would be a slave again. OK. As the player clicks the only available option, we hear the auction crier splitting up a family. Despite the colorful flatness of the animation, the game's architecture is profoundly affecting. To my mind, the resistive potential of such games exists in moments like these, when they are least like games that they most successfully provide an experience in line with the subject matter, when they foreclose options, when they restrict the player's access, or, as in these frames, where your only available option is to keep clicking OK, when they give an illusion of choice that is not a choice at all. These are the moments when games like this come closest to approximating the experience of slavery. And in this recreation slash recreation, I think games like this can open up a space for cultural redress, to use Saida Hartman's term. There are other examples, too, that I hope to use in my larger project. But for the sake of time here, I'll just briefly gloss a few of these other educational games. This comes from a first-person perspective game created by National Geographic for the iPad called Underground Railroad Journey to Freedom. The player is never named or shown to lend to the student's immersion in the game. But the character runs away from a Maryland tobacco plantation with his friend Amos, who is seen here, and meets Harriet Tubman along the way. The gameplay consists of good 3D-style animation graphics, perhaps a bit too much like a Sunday morning cartoon, and the mechanics of play involve mostly mousing over objects and clicking dialog boxes, as the player must make choices to advance a successful escape. 
While the first part of the game mentions the difficulty of toiling in the fields, the threat of the lash, and the fact that your mother was recently sold off, none of this is depicted visually. And the game's focus feels like it is on the thrill of escape, on the choices faced, like whether to take the river or the road, and on the application of objects that you hold in your bindle, like forged papers or a pocket knife, to the challenges that reveal themselves. If you get caught by slave catchers, you are returned to your plantation and sold further south as punishment. Though it is possible to get caught and return to bondage, Journey to Freedom also offers two paths to also offers two paths to freedom, one in which you stay in the US and work with Frederick Douglass, eventually buying your freedom, and the other in which you successfully escape to Canada. The game concludes, quote, you've come to the end of this journey, end quote, but offers you a play again button, no matter what the outcome. An online scholastic resource called The Underground Railroad Escape from Slavery is a series of historical photographs with an accompanying narrative about a young, skilled woodworking slave named Walter. The story includes an option to have it read aloud, and the images are dotted with hyperlinks to other resources and teacher activities. Interactivity here is limited, but clicking certain designated spots on the image will bring up windows and further information. Like more historical images, bit of slave narratives, and even mini slideshows, I think there's a mini slideshow on Nat Turner, if memory serves. This digital narrative is different than the others that I'm interested in, however, because it's only barely semi-interactive. The player is never put in the position of power over the slave's decision making and does not occupy a slave's perspective through subjective camera or through the narrative use of second person. More interactive are educational experiences like following the footsteps on the website Pathways to Freedom, Maryland, and the Underground Railroad. Following the footsteps is a simple flash animation game written in second person at an elementary reading level that includes basic imagery and a written passage read aloud. Early on, the narrative explains the daily lot of the slave child with whom the player is called to identify. Quote, you spend most of your days in the big house doing chores like hauling firewood and taking care of the master's children. They can play whenever they want, but you can't. You have to work, end quote. The appeal to empathy is obvious here, and I think effective even in its disturbing nature. You are told that your family has died, only one brother and one sister remain to you. After constructing a narrative conflict in which the slaves are being sold off, the game forces you to make the first of several choices. This is engineered by clicking on either side of a divided screen, as seen here, depicting the outstretched hand of one sibling and a palm calling for pause, respectively. Do you want to stay on the plantation with your brother or run away with your sister? If you stay with your brother, you are subsequently sold away from each other and your story ends. If you go with your sister, your narrative continues, providing you with more choices, such as whether to hide during the day or continue your journey as you attempt your way north to freedom. Finally, for this section of the talk, although it is not actually a video game, I want to conclude this part, our tour of educational games, with a still image from a web animation by Brad Neely called American Moments of Maybe. This 2009 animation includes a satiric portrait of kids, of children playing a fake console video game called Nat Turner's Punch-Out, a reference to the 1987 Nintendo game, Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. Posing as an advertisement for a video game based on the slave revolt led by Nat Turner in Southampton, Virginia in 1831, part one of Neely's animation, American Moments of Maybe, seemingly lambasts the tastelessness of the entertainment industry. In the game, children play as Nat Turner. One image of the animation states that freeing your friends from slavery is worth 10,000 points. But this parodic content is actually pretty much the case with two recent games created by video game, video game manufacturer Ubisoft that specifically create an entertainment experience in which the goal of the game is to free slaves, and I would argue, feel good about yourself for having done so. Advertised in the animation as 
the game about freedom and the game that makes history alive, Neely's animation depicts a cluster of adolescents of varied, varied races and genders, eagerly anticipating and then playing the game. Neely carefully stages the question of player identity in his parody, asking what type of experience is afforded to gamers with diverse sets of privilege. In one frame of the animation, a black kid and a white kid are shown playing together. Posed against a yellow background, they share the frame equally, visually joined by their counterbalancing gestures as they manipulate the controllers, and connected by the cords that extend out of the frame. A speech bubble hangs between them, indicating that the white teen says to the black teen as they play a game about slavery, America used to suck pretty hard. Read in the era of Black Lives Matter, I propose that this image takes on a rich significance, pointing to the fact that these games change with the player's diverse experiences and their own cultural identities. Now, my interest is not in creating a polemic argument about what games should and should not do, but in interrogating moments where games about slavery or defiance of slavery offer a new type of experience of slave narratives, specifically a playable, interactive experience open to players of all kinds and the potential complications therein. The image above, for example, raises the question of whether video games about slave revolt allow one to situate oneself in relation to the history of black resistance or usurp that past for entertainment value. In stark terms, what we have in this still from Neely's animation is a visualization of the fact that the gamic text will not only play out differently, depending upon the player's choices and their skill level, but the games with social content, such as those about slave revolt, will take on different significations depending upon the player's real life identity. So here's where we can all put our heads together. Drawing on your experiences with the game that we demoed thralled and hopefully continue our conversations about our varied experiences of playing this first level of the game that was on display in Evelyn's Cafe. I'm gonna start by, pre provide, by presenting my own experience with this game and filling in those of you who might not have had a chance to uh, demo it. So this is part three, under the microscope, thralled. First, let's start with some details. Thralled is a side-scrolling puzzle game in which you pilot the small figure of Isaura across the landscape. On a black screen, the opening frame of the game inform the player of the historical context with which the game is concerned. Quote, between 1500 and 1888, an estimated 12 million African men, women, and children were forcibly taken from their homes and sold as slaves in the Americas. The majority of these Africans were taken to the Portuguese colony of Brazil and forced to work on its sugarcane plantations. Among them was Isaura, end quote. As the title cards share the information with the player, there's only the sound of a dense rain falling. And as the last words dissolve, we hear the sound of a baby crying, a sound to which the player of this game must grow accustomed. As the image of Isaura holding her child at the foot of a giant mangrove tree fades in. Super titles situate the action. Pernambuco, Brazil, 1700s. The rain falls upon Isora and her baby until the gamer begins the action by shushing the child, a gesture that will become a frequent and an urgent one, at which point the perspective zooms out and the familiar haunting humming of the game's soundtrack begins. At this point, the player has control of Isaura and must move her from the left to the right of the screen, helping her to cross the terrain, remove obstacles, and use objects along the way to make her path easier. She can backtrack only a certain distance. A waterfall appears to the left of the screen that marks the point of no return. So let me just begin by saying candidly that other, unlike other side-scrolling games that I've played, I found there to be absolutely nothing even remotely enjoyable about Thralled. In fact, as a mother, the persistent crying of the infant made this chapter an anxiety-filled agony for me. 
In particularly tense moments, other equally piercing sounds intrude into the oral space. There was something like the braying of a donkey, which I found grated on my nerves like a metallic screech, and eerie music that elicited goose flesh the first dozen times that I played the level. In fact, my family begged me to mute the game, but I felt like that was cheating, so I kept the sound on. The most intense moments come when Isaura arrives at locations that she cannot traverse while holding the baby, such as a high rock face that needs to be scaled. She must then find a designated safe zone, a bower, in which to lay the baby down while she accomplishes a task that allows them to cross, like performing a complicated set of maneuvers to use an overturned wagon as a stepladder. The whole of the time that the baby is not in Isaura's arms, he wails discomfortingly for his mother. And as if there, that wasn't stressful enough, there's also the apparition to worry about. Called the reflection by the game developers, this figure is a pale, somewhat transparent woman that looks something like Isaura's white double. Ghostly or witch-like, this specter pursues you as you cross the jungle. If the wailing child is left too long in the bower, she reaches him and her touch causes the game to end. As she draws closer to the baby, sounds warn you that your time is running out, which only heightens the gamer's stress. Perhaps aptly, the ghost's approach is signaled by a mechanical sound, maybe meant to evoke the grinding of the gears in the sugarcane mill. If the apparition touches the baby, the entire level must then be replayed from the start. If you finish your task and reach the baby before the white woman, you still have to successfully quiet the, the cries or else she can claim him, a fact which makes comforting the baby quickly a crucial skill. Thereby, for my part, the game consisted of often having to replay the level and repeat the same gestures in a frenzied manner, my nerves frayed by the sounds of the baby's cries and the tense auditory signals of the witch's approach which add to the dread of what will happen if you aren't fast enough. For one, you'll have to suffer through this same routine once more. Of course, this was just my experience of the game. When I demoed the first chapter in one of my classes at the University of Tampa, a student played the game smoothly the whole way through the first time. Thus, we must always bear in mind the fact that the game changes depending upon the player. But for me, the game was a repetitive labor, and as such, the game's insistence on repetition recalled the historical labor of the slave. Repetition also works, of course, to represent the theme of trauma. Because the opening title cards declare that the gameplay takes place in Brazil, and the mission statement of the game affirms that Isaura is a runaway slave who lost her child, not a runaway slave carrying her infant, there may be reason to suspect that this first level is representative of the way Isaura psychologically replays her separation from her baby. The surrealism of the seemingly straightforward game may re be revealed in this bit of background information provided in the programmer's description. Quote, captured from a small village in the depths of Congo, Isaura is separated from her child upon arrival to the new world and is forced to work on the plantations. After years of bondage, she escapes from the fields and sets out to find her lost son, hiding amidst the Brazilian wilderness while being sought as a runaway. Is she then really holding her baby as she makes this journey, or is this level that we've all played a fantasy? The demos viewable online show that in later levels, Isaura, now alone, traverses labyrinthine passages cluttered with locked doors, barred windows, and mirrors, as she must make her way through disorienting spaces on the plantation and in the sugar works in a truly nightmarish landscape. Apart from this clue in the mission statement, however, the gamer would most likely read the first level literally, as a woman's attempt to flee her enslavement through the Brazilian wilderness with her child. She's dressed in a style we associate with the slave women of the Americas in a blue kerchief and belling skirts. But other aspects of the landscape might make the player wonder if this first level isn't actually a depiction of her initial capture in the Congo region of Africa. For one thing, the landscape Isaura traverses is punctuated with Nikisi, 
a Congolese tradition in which a human figure is carved out of wood, stuck with nails and other sharp objects as a talisman of protection and appeal to, or even sometimes considered, a vessel for a spirit. These are seen hanging from the trees under which Isaura walks. Would such fetishes be so prevalent in Portuguese Brazil? The Nikisi that hang from the trees could be confused for lynched bodies. In fact, that's what I thought they were the first time I played the game. We might read them, though, perhaps as actually lynched bodies in Brazil, which Isora reimagines as protective spirits. She never seems to be able to interact with these figures. At one point, she discovers a large Nikisi in an underground cave, one that is distinctly a mother holding a child, an echo of Isaura's own loss. Or is this a statue, maybe a Madonna with child, that Isaura has conflated into a Nikisi? Regardless, Isaura is unable to reach the figure without triggering an avalanche of debris that blocks her path to it. Frustrations and limitations of one's movement define the gameplay throughout, further emphasizing the theme of slavery in the game. The apparition that haunts Isaura too might be most logically read as the Congolese ghost Vumbi, and yes, it is related to a zombie, ask me why later, an ancestral spirit. Because these spirits are described as pale entities, captured Africans sold to European slavers often confuse the whites for ghosts. Maybe you've heard that before. Perhaps she's meant to represent the white colonizers who separated Isaura from her child. This does match up with what happens at the end of the first chapter. No matter how successfully Isaura manages to outrun the apparition, accomplishing her tasks in a timely manner, retrieving her child from the safe zones, and managing to soothe him and stop his heart-wrenching cries before this ghostly woman closes the distance to the infant. At the end, Isora emerges from an underground cavern to face the woman, and with nowhere to run, the specter approaches her and lays hands on the child. There is a dissolve to an image of Isaura drowning beneath the water, with her child floating away from her perhaps a metaphoric representation of her crossing the ocean to slavery. After this, the game title appears. Is this first level then a preamble? Is this a representation of Isaura's capture in Africa or something in between? A representation of her escape from a plantation in Brazil, which is overlaid with traumatic flashbacks that signify her separation from her baby and her homeland? Of course, this first level that we demoed is not the whole of the game which makes it difficult to analyze as a standalone artifact, for it raises many more questions than it answers. It would seem that what we are witnessing is the way Isora bears with her the trauma of her separation from her child. But regardless of whether the complicated game ultimately, con I'm sorry, the completed game, regardless of whether the completed game ultimately contradicts my interpretation, the fact that the white figure cannot be eluded at the chapter's end adds much to the feeling of disempowerment that this tense, exhausting demo creates in its form as much as in its content. Created by students at the USC Games Lab, Thralled seems to be in a direct lineage of what are called serious games, like Darfur is Dying, and particularly Hush, a game about a Rwandan mother who must quiet her child to avoid detection by soldiers. Those interested in the game can access the mission statement and trailer on its game's website, thrall.org, and limited playthroughs and student demonstrations are available on YouTube. But I'd like to suggest that rather than being a detriment, the game's unfinishedness, its limited, limited accessibility, seem to work all the more in tandem with its theme of rebellion. Like Romero's analog video game, it can be thought of in, in this unfinished form as a non-game. And although this is not quite thought through yet, it's my hope that I might read this fragment of a game, this first chapter of a video game which might never be completed, in light of the lack of memorials or unintended memorials to slave revolt that exist in this country. Um, for example, there you have Igbo Landing where um, a group of slaves committed mass suicide in a river, and here you have uh, signpost reading, blackhead signpost that happened is where Nat Turner's rebellion took place. So now we arrive at the final part, and it is shorter than the other four parts. <laughs> 
part four, reincarnation. So first, by a show of hands, how many of you have ever played an Assassin's Creed game? Okay. Not as many as I would have thought, but <laughs> some of you. That's good, because I'll explain it anyway, whether you had or not. You actually don't need to know much about Assassin's Creed to understand the relatively simple point that I want to make about a couple of the games, which depict a slave in revolt or the emancipation of slaves. But here's a quick gloss to everyone so that everybody is on the same page. The central intrigue of the Assassin's Creed franchise concerns a long-standing war between the Brotherhood of the Assassins and the secretive order of the Templars, who wage their battles throughout history by means of a device called the Animus, which allows the character of the frame narrative, Desmond Miles, the white guy at the top, to access his ancestors' memories and, in a virtual sense, be transported back in time, or, in essence, reincarnate them. Now, Desmond appears to be a white male, and other scholars have taken up the problematics of Desmond's role, as when he incarnates a Mohawk ancestor in a game about the American Revolution. However, this frame narrative, wherein the player plays as Desmond playing as someone else, is totally absent from the two games that I want to talk about here, Assassin's Creed Liberation and Freedom Cry, a DLC or downloadable content that accompanies the game Black Flag, which is about pirates in the Caribbean. Some could argue that the absence of miles from these games makes our characters more directly into commodities. But there are other scholars doing this work, and that's not my argument. I think the important issue here is that the games offer the player a chance to directly be reincarnated as a rebel slave. In the two games I'm concerned with here, the player incarnates Adwale, a former Trinidadian slave in Freedom Cry, and Aveline, a free woman of color, the daughter of a slave and her master in Liberation. Therefore, the player, it might be assumed, can directly step into the character's life, his and her digital skin. The games are not without their problems, their cringeworthy moments of cultural appropriation or insensitivity. And in particular, I've argued elsewhere about the game's, how do I say it, abuses of Haitian history. Nonetheless, in the brief time that I have left, I want to suggest that the games actually do include a very subversive maneuver that maintains a space between the player and the character, a distance that acknowledges that playing the rebel slave is nothing like being a rebel slave, and that preserves, even if only in a small measure, the dignity of histories of resistance. Such aporia hold the player at arm's length, reminding him that his absorption into the character's life is incomplete. So we might actually go back to this image if you need a visual for my thesis here. It seems like the games are inviting anyone in, like the open hand on the left, but actually I'm arguing that there are subtle ways in which they block the player's mastery of the game, as if holding the gamer at bay, like the image on the right, in a way that I think acknowledges the problem of commoditizing access to this history and maybe signals to, to the issue of privilege in gaming that Neely's animation raises. Here, I'm just gonna present one way that these gaps work, and that is within the game's uses of untranslated language. In Liberation, the player incarnates a free woman of color living in New Orleans. The product of a slave from Saint-Domingue and her white master, Aveline de Grand Pré, is our assassin. Her mother disappeared when she was just a child, and she was raised by her white father and stepmother, wealthy New Orleans merchants. Illustrating the diversity of roles afforded to people of color in New Orleans, Aveline has three costumes that she wears throughout the game, each coming with different skill sets, and eliciting different treatment by the community as she walks through the city. In the assassin's hood, the slave's rags, and the lady's gown. For example, when she's dressed as the lady, she has this ability to charm that, frankly, I find really gross. Um, but they all have different, like, powers or whatnot. Um, and I'll read this part because it seems like not many of you have actually played this game. In brief, 
<clears throat> Liberation's gameplay includes a series of missions, some of which are concerned with the treatment of slaves and do aid in their capture, I mean, sorry, aid in their escape, but most of which are about battles for control of territory between corrupt Spanish governors and intrigue between smugglers in the swamplands. The theme of liberating the slaves is present here, but it seems subsidiary to Aveline's efforts to uncover the truth about her mother's involvement with the assassin syndicate. When Aveline's father grows ill, Aveline continues managing his shipping routes for sale in commodities like cotton and tobacco. In one mission, she makes money through her father's shipping company and buys out a competitor to pay his slaves a living wage, thereby liberating them, but via capitalism. In short, liberation would seem to not be a radical abolitionist game in the big picture, but one that co-ops imagery of slave revolt for its own purposes as an entertainment commodity. And yet, language works in an interesting manner in this game. It is a hallmark of the Assassin's Creed franchise and a feature in many other video games as well that foreign languages are not translated for the player. But here I'm arguing untranslated language works as an important sieve, reminding us that not all players will have the same experience of the game. In Assassin's Creed, foreign languages are typically translated only in the cutscenes and only if you have enabled subtitles, which act like closed captioning. Rendering in text all spoken dialogue in these scripted cinematic interludes and providing translations in brackets when that speech has been delivered in a language other than the player's chosen setting. In Liberation, the in-game dialogue in French is never translated. So if you're just walking down the street, you're constantly hearing French, but there's no translation given even if you put on the closed captioning. Lending, on the one hand, to the realism of the player's journey to another time and space, but equally delineating an inaccessible territory for the non-French speaker in this case. The Francophone gamer will therefore have a more complete understanding of the game world than the non-French speaker. Here's one way that this manifests in liberation. Just as Aveline has different skills, she elicits different reactions from the community depending upon her changing identity when she's dressed as the lady, the slave, or the assassin. To understand the full scope of how Aveline is thought of by the community, one needs to understand what the townspeople say to her and about her as she passes by. If Aveline bumps into a stranger while wearing the lady's gown, she is treated politely. Pardonnez-moi, mademoiselle. There's a polite inflection in the women's voices and sometimes a slightly lustful one in the men's. Yet, when this same lady finds herself in a different part of town, near the cemetery, where there are more people of color, for instance, a black woman says in French as she passes, look at her making herself out to be a lady. So therefore, you won't really understand that some people are seeing through this facade, uh, unless you are able to understand those untranslated snippets. If, when dressed as a slave, she bumps into a fellow slave, she may garner an abrupt, tu es folle, You're, are you crazy? But if she bumps into a slave while dressed as the assassin or the lady, she will not be spoken to, much less insulted. The game provides a rich diversity of experience. The same character, sporting different clothes, will be treated differently by the members of her community, signaling to the difficult issue of identity in the colonial society represented in the game, where class and race determine one's status in society. And I think in general, this is just kind of a takedown of how stupid racism is, right? that you're gonna judge somebody based on what they look like. So in part, there's a political commentary here, but at the same time, this persona system highlights the issue of player diversity. Acknowledging, I want to argue, the different player identities change the significance of the game. If you speak French, you will have a deeper understanding of the game than if you don't, like a secret level to which not all are permitted access. Yes, Using language in this way may be a hallmark of the franchise, but I think this strategy is particularly important in a text that invites players of diverse backgrounds to incarnate the body of a black woman struggling against the historical institution of Atlantic slavery. The same device is used in Ubisoft's Freedom Cry. 
In Freedom Cry, the player incarnates a character called Adewale, a former slave, as he journeys to Saint-Domingue, the French colony that would become Haiti after a slave revolt became a war for independence. There, Adewale fights to free slaves and eventually falls in league with a band of maroon slaves waging war against the colonial governor. The gameplay begins on board a ship off the coast of Saint-Domingue with Adewale fighting off an enemy fleet. When he intercepts a package meant for a recipient in Port-au-Prince, he turns his attention in that direction. Wrecking just off the island, his first experience comes when he stumbles upon a white overseer about to rape a female slave, who hisses threats, spoken only in French, that he will cut off her ears if she doesn't submit. Grabbing hold of the first weapon he sees, a machete, what was historically the tool of the cane-cutting slave, Adwale begins to chase down the overseer. The gamer is given his first command on the island, from whence I have taken the title of this talk, Kill the Overseer. The first instance of Creole is heard in this same scene, from the slave whom Adwale saves from violation, saying in answer to his question about how to find the character he seeks, the, the, the person that the package belongs to. Mwen mem pakonen, me personally, I don't know her. The video game incorporates not only French dialogue, as in Liberation, the language of the colonists present in Saint-Domingue, but also Haitian Creole and even some Trinidadian Creole. And though language is translated in the cutscenes as it is in Liberation, and this use of Creole, for example, was translated in a cutscene, foreign languages in gameplay remain always untranslated for the gamer. The choice to leave language untranslated works to particular effect in a game about slavery and slave revolt. And I believe this effect is admitted in the inclusion early on in the game of a password. When Adwale meets with the intended recipient of the parcel he bears, Bastien Joseph, a wealthy and influential black madam, he is given several tasks to prove his worth, to find his way on one of his missions, she teaches him to sing a snippet of song to the field slaves as a passcode to gain access and information. The song is a line from a traditional Haitian lullaby, Sili pa dodo crab la va manger, which roughly translates to, if you don't go to sleep, the crab will eat you. Now, while it is true that recognizing that the song is a lullaby and knowing what it means don't seem to further one's understanding of the game, its inclusion here acknowledges that the use of language in Freedom Cry acts similarly to a kind of passcode, holding some gamers at bay and admitting others. Thus, language works structurally to create a hierarchy of identification. The player who speaks Creole will have a deeper understanding to, to the, of this game than the player who merely speaks French or the player who speaks neither. And this highlights a historical aspect of the difficulty of organized slave resistance. How to speak about it in such a way that the message would be received only by one's intended recipients, one's comrades, but not reach the ears of one's adversaries. Finally then, I think that games about slavery work best when they operate like this statue to the maroon slave that stands in downtown Port-au-Prince. Here the lone figure is depicted blowing the conch, the secret call to arms, one that the viewer, of course, can see but not hear in this form. As such, it emphasizes that historical rebel slaves need to talk of revolution in such a way that only his compatriots could hear his message, that would not raise the alarm of the white colonial masters or those unsupportive to his cause. The silence emphasizes, therefore, that this is not a statue that belongs to everyone. Just as Beyonce's formation video was, as noted in the SNL spoof, surely not for everyone. And that foreclosure of accessibility, as seen in the use of language in Liberation and Freedom Cry, and even, I would say, in the interactive form of the video game more broadly, where the narrative has to be earned via digital labor and gameplay, is precisely what makes these narratives subversive works of cultural redress. In conclusion, 
The interactivity of the narrative structure of the video game is endemic to the medium, but I think that it takes on new resonances in depictions of slave revolt. It calls to mind, for instance, the way the pilotable avatar itself parallels a slave. It also raises the question of what is at stake in ownership of these narratives. In offering the gamer an opportunity to play as a rebel slave, games might reduce matters of deep historical importance to cheap entertainment. But I think they can also work in a productive manner to highlight the issue of cultural inheritance by restricting the gamer's accessibility to the full story or by requiring empathic labor on the part of the player to unlock it. They initiate a conversation about how we see ourselves in relationship to the history of slavery, raising the question of whether the right to occupy that history is something that we buy, are born into, or earn. Thank you. So, are, can we, I do my thing? Yes. Yeah, All right. Thing. <laughs> I can't wander from the microphone because they didn't. I didn't want them to mic me, so I still have to stand here. So we decided that because this kind of a long talk. Um, Rather than having a typical Q&A, we were going to flip the script, and I was going to ask you some questions. How do you feel about that? Three. All right, awesome. So I only got three because I, it's late, I know, and people are hungry, and they want to get to dinner and drinks and all of that. Um, so for those of you who had a chance, am I, I'm yelling like right into the mic, I'm sorry. For those of you who had a, ch a chance to play Thralled even a little bit, um, I would love to hear from some of you. Did, was it as difficult for you as it was for me? Did you find it fun? Did you find it disturbing? Just basically, what were your impressions of the game? I, did somebody start to say something? Yes. <laughs> anyone. I can't call on anyone because I can't see you guys. <laughs> okay. Oh, she's got it. Um, it was kind of the first time I play a video game. Also, oh, like okay. I'm not into games. And um, so it was difficult because nothing was happening at the beginning. I thought I didn't have the control, like this thing yeah. of the agency. And then suddenly it seemed I had some control on it. Okay, because great. I could put the baby on the floor. Right. And, and then someone, like, there was more interactive than in the game because there was someone outside that told me, Oh, are you going inside to the talk? Yes. Okay, hurry up, you have to go. <laughs> so the baby was on the floor, and I was going to leave. I took the baby. And okay. I, I felt great because I saved it, but the baby was crying. Yes. And then I left, and, and all my classmates, you killed the baby, no? So I, at the end, I ended up killing the baby because of the cry. Yeah, and, I don't think yeah, that baby made it. But, um, but yeah, was, your confusion yeah. about how exactly you start the game um, and how to control the game, that's, that's useful. Other people? Like, was there anyone who was like my student who just zipped through it and was like, what's the big deal? It was totally easy. Like, I don't get the problem. Nobody? That makes me feel good. I feel like she cheated and, like, watched a YouTube playthrough. OK, second question. Um, this one's hard. It's going to be hard for me. I don't know if it'll be hard for you. I, wanna, I really want to know like, what you think about, so basically, like, if I were telling you what I thought I just talked about, I would say my, that the, the kernel of the talk is really about whether it could be productive to hold a space between the player and the gamer, to kind of have this no man's land, that you don't get full immersion, um, especially in games with social content. So I guess my question in simple terms is, like, do you buy that? If not, why not? And have you seen other games do it? Um, I was thinking about when I played the Assassin's Creed games, um, how they, they're not like necessarily Grand Theft Auto where you just have free reign to do whatever you want. Right. Um, so like, let's say you want to do something bad instead of your objectives. Like, 
I remember in the original games, you'd have this thing where you desync or something, where you basically like oh, you, yeah. you lose or you have to start over. Mm -hmm. So there's a sense of restriction in that sense that um, it's not like an open sandbox where right. you can just say, well, I don't want to do that. I want to do something that my character wouldn't, doesn't, isn't told to do. You know, I want right. to join the Templars or you know just kill kill all the slaves that are here or whatever like crazy thing you want to do. You're not necessarily allowed to do that as a player. Okay, so all right. So if I un so you feel like that your immersion was already limited because you don't have free reign. Yeah, I think it's okay. It's good if like in some games you create your own player and mm -hmm. you have this sense of I'll just do whatever I want in the mm -hmm. game and have fun like that. But in a game where you're trying to play in a historical sense or you're playing through a different character who's not your own creation, um, I think it's good to have those restrictions where it doesn't, it discourages the player from um, unreasonable actions or like puts restrictions on them so you, um, you're not missing the point of the game and, and you know. Right. So I, I thought that was a part of the, the series that I thought was a good, a good idea that separates it from like some of the more um, wild games like Saints Row or whatever where they just encourage. So you, do, you feel like these games already were more ethical or already had a kind um, of social critique element to them? That they were just more focused. And yeah. a lot of games now are focusing on this really open sandbox right. where you just do whatever you want. Mm. But these tend to be a bit more focused on those on the player you're playing and like right. they don't leave everything up to the player to just do whatever they want. That's really useful to me because actually in the longer piece that this is from, I say like you can make this an open sandbox game if you want. Um, and now you're reminding me that that's not really true. I mean, my argument was like if you just wanted to run around Port-au-Prince, um, you know, if you just wanted to, ex to explore the city. But yeah, that's, that's a good uh, note. Hello. Hello. Hi. <clears throat> okay, cool. Um, so I confess that see, finding restrictions in video games tends to be a fascinating experience or fascinating exercise for me, at mm -hmm. least um, trying to act like an game, independent game developer and game designer. Um, like there are like numerous moments that really strikes to me. Like um, if anyone has heard of a Japanese game, game called Mother Three, the ending. Where, um, the ending where they skillfully remove an ability is one that really sticks to my heart. Hmm. Um, another one that I wanted to kind of mention was uh, Killer7, which, which to me is a very unusual and ironic game in a sense that most games, like especially during that age when that game came out, most games were aiming for you know maximum immersion factor, like trying to as much as possible remove any element of uh, reminding the player that they're playing a game. Right. And Killer7 very took a very opposite approach. It's a very thought-provoking political game, according to at least the Japanese developers of it. Um, but when you're uh, but when you're playing it, you're constantly reminded it's a game. The only right. way to move forward is to hold down a single button rather mm -hmm. than using a control stick at all. Okay. Which like goes directly in face of every game convention you've ever heard of. And that's the one called Killer7? Yes. Okay. Uh, for the GameCube and the PlayStation 2. Great. Um, um, so I, I don't know. I was going to recommend that one because I personally find that the most fascinating um, yeah. amongst the limit the contr limit the player from what they can do perspective. Have you ever seen, because one thing that happened to me, interestingly, when I was playing Assassin's Creed is that I was glitched out of a reward. <laughs> and I felt like I was so into feeling like... Um, under the thumb of the programmer, that at that point I was like, is this really a glitch? Or like, are there games where there's like fake glitches, where like they just all of a sudden break the rules? And yeah? yeah. Which ones are, I mean, I don't need to know this for my work, I'm just interested in it. <laughs> um, it sounds like that actually Mother 3, the one that you talked about, seems like it was breaking the rules. But I was specifically, I'm, I'm also interested in like the space outside of the gameplay itself where it's like people have to discover like in the online chat rooms where they're like that's not actually a glitch like the the narrativizing that um, occurs in fan spaces about these games 
I want to make a shout out to Fez, which has a lot of actual glitches and a lot of moments where you think they're glitches, but they're all deliberate. Oh, so that okay. one's a weird one where I'm sure internet discussions goes on about, was that actually supposed to be a glitch? Yeah. And more often than not, actually, it turns out to be. So. Just a glitch, yeah. <laughs> well, I think glitching is a productive concept, too. Can I ask one more? Yeah, do your one more. and then we'll... Okay. My last one, because obviously, I, you know, I, one thing that's been so great about my visit here is I got to talk to some students who I think will become future gamers, and there are, are I'm sure, some game develop. I mean, future game developers, and maybe there's some game developers here tonight. And um, so you're... I just want to data mine your brains because I am really a scholar of slave narratives and the way uh, we do slave narratives in popular culture. So I don't study games nearly as extensively as you guys. So I'm wondering, are there other games about slave revolt that I should know about, especially popular ones? Like, I think I'm doing okay finding the educational ones. But, um, and I've played... Bioshock Infinite, which isn't really about slave revolt, though they do use Negro spirituals at one part, and it's kind of a subtext. I'm not interested really in like the alien world slave revolts, which of which there are many. Um, and I'm also not that interested in like the empire colonial sort of model where you're you're you know it's almost like a digital version of Risk, where there might be an incidental slave revolt. But have I missed anything that I need to be? Playing. There's a board game, I don't know if you know, called Freedom. No, I don't. It's, it's, by, um, it's Academy Games. Academy Games? Yeah. What was it about? What, what did you say about the railroad? Uh, so it's called Freedom, the mm -hmm. Underground Railroad. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, it's a board game. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so I think we're going to wrap up here. And if there are burning questions from the audience that you would like to ask Sarah, um, we're going to hang out a bit in Evelyn's Cafe so that you guys can play the game and or ask Sarah any lingering questions that you might have. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate your being here, and I hope you'll join us again soon. Have a good night.